So I want to talk about where we are right now with the commercial sector. You know, the commercial sector seems to be charging ahead in space. And one area where commercial advances have been astounding is in imagery. Today's commercial satellite imagery is often very high quality. They're even taking HD video from space. Uh, meanwhile, our intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance is what I understand the Pentagon calls a high demand, low density asset, which means everybody wants it and there's not enough to go around. So let me start, General Goldfine, if I could, how is the department incorporating commercial imagery in a sur as a service into its approach? And conversely, how do you think about the risks that the wide availability of imagery pose for the United States? Yes, ma'am. The reality is we sense the domain, we sense the globe in six domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber. And then someone's got to take all those ones and zeros and turn it into decision quality speed, their decision quality information to allow us to achieve decision speed. Much of that falls on the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And we are continually looking at ways to integrate non-traditional means of intelligence into that sensing so that we can fuse that into this common operational picture. And I will tell you that we, that we are using commercial imagery we're using other sources that can bring, you know, we're using social media in ways that we haven't before. And so this is a broader discussion about how do you leverage public-private partnerships and the commercial industry to be able to increase your decision speed and your ability to get that common operational picture. So let me, let me then just follow up on that a little bit, General. You know, our satellite programs are incredibly complex. They're also incredibly expensive. Um, oftentimes, a single satellite can cost billions of dollars. Meanwhile, the advances in technology on the commercial side are making sophisticated technology smaller, lighter, cheaper every day. Uh, a little startup company in Massachusetts can buy small, lightweight CubeSat. I think you said you have one of those here. Uh, for less than $10,000. And it doesn't cost much more than that to launch it into space. I get it that a CubeSat obviously doesn't have the same capabilities as the next generation GPS, but it seems like there are some missions that a smaller or less technically sophisticated satellite would do just as well. It, maybe I could include you in this, uh, General Graves. How do you assess the trade-offs between large technically sophisticated satellites and smaller but potentially less powerful constellations. How do you think about that? Um, Mayor, uh, Senator, we, we actually think about that daily and it's part of our um, acquisition strategies that we develop. Just, just one example, one vignette, for the uh, space-based infrared system that, that uh, flies out of uh, Colorado. Um, we're setting up a um, data uh, framework consortium to essentially go after commercial capability to integrate into our tools, applications, and processing lab to essentially ingest commercial data, whether it's imagery or OPIR or other sensors, and combine that with um, what, what Cybers produces as an example and exploit that and fuse it and send it out to, to users. So that's just one, one example. Well, I, I have to say I'm really glad that you're thinking about this and you think about the ways that you can integrate. You know, it seems to me that a high-low mix of advanced and more basic capabilities in our satellite inventory uh, would be a good way to think about it, kind of the same way we think about aircraft uh, in this area. It, capitalizing in advances, though, in technology is possible only if we can afford to do it. But, Ms. Chaplin, a lot of our space acquisitions seem to remain bogged down. Last year, the GAO reported that several of the department's most critical space programs remain over budget and behind schedule. So, Ms. Chaplin, could you say a word about how the department, what it should be doing to stay on schedule and to rein in costs in this area? So, I think a two pronged approach is needed. One, you really need to focus on the acquisition fundamentals. In recent reports, we're hearing issues about systems engineering, uh, contractor performance, um, lots of management and oversight issues that seem to persist. So those really need to be addressed. And then on the second pronged approach, 
um, really looking at the fragmentation and leadership so that we can speed up decision making, be more agile, get agreements early on. That, that doesn't really happen as much as it should on space. And then I agree with you about the commercial suppliers and can they be brought in to offer a mix of approaches. Um, for years, commercial suppliers have always felt like it's talked to the hand when it comes time to deal with the Department of Defense, and maybe you've heard of that. Um, and there's also a lack of contracting mechanisms to help them engage with defense, especially when it comes to things like buying bandwidth or something like that. Um, the DOD has been trying some prototype efforts to be able to buy services better, but I think a lot more can be done to bring in that kind of innovation. Good. I, I'm very glad to hear this. Obviously, the cost growth in satellites is limiting our capacity to buy what it is that we need to buy. And we owe it to the taxpayer, we owe it to our national security to get these costs down to a place that we can get the full range of response that we need. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And thank you, Madam Chair.